Good morning, this is Satya Srinivasan. I head the healthcare practice for Axion Labs. Uh, today, we are uh, we are going to be discussing in a topic for mental health. Uh, more so over, we are going to be discussing how technology is enabling the mental health space and uh, how it is enabling the patient care, the patient accessibilities, and also going to talk about the mental health in AI. So these are some of the top three topics that we would be like to cover as part of our webinar. Uh, under this whole webinar concept, what we did is we kind of moved away from a traditional path of bringing in a technologist, but we are moving to excited to also bring in a doctor's group that is going to enable to talk to us about how technology and mental health are combined. And we can hear from the doctor's experts view of how this is changing the landscape than from a technologist. That's that's exactly how we want to talk about than bringing a technologist to this web forum. Uh, talking about that, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Bunsell. Dr. Bunsell is a CEO and the medical director of MindWheel. And uh, MindWheel, of course, is a mental health platform and which is dedicated to provide high quality care to children and adolescents. And Dr. Bunsell is uh, in fellowship in child adolescent psychiatry from the University of Michigan. And he's a residency and psychiatric from the Wayne State University. And Dr. Bunsell has extensive experience in both clinical and administrative roles. Um, he's also done a lot of mental health publications and widely regarded from the field of neuroimaging and autism. And he's also board certified and is also licensed at multiple states, including Illinois, Missouri, and Texas. Dr. Bunsell. Thank you so much, Satya. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm very excited to be here and looking forward to our discussion. And thank you for arranging this important topic to discuss. Thank you so much for being on the panel. And along with us, we're also going to have Dr. Matthews. Dr. Matthews, also a board certified uh, psychiatrist. Um, he's under the pain management physician and also trained in UK and Cleveland Clinic, served as a head of the pain medicines. He's currently in a private practice in Fort Worth, and his most of the career has been spent in patient outcomes, management of patient groups and creation of healthcare and healthcare utilization creation of systems. Dr. Matthews, welcome to the board. Thank you so much, Satya. I uh, really uh, am grateful that you invited me to be a part of this panel. And thank you. Thank you both of you guys for doing this. Um, again, going back to the topic, how technology enables mental health and how does it differentiates in the industry and the market space? We are more interested in understanding your views than a technologist's views, right? Starting with Dr. Bunsell. Dr. Bunsell, uh, how do you envision or how do you see this technology creates a leverage for a more personalized patient experience? How does it increase the and improves the quality of a mental health and personalized patient experiences. Can we can you go a little bit deeper to help us understand how this operates and how technology unison is making this more elaborate? Great, great. Great question, Satya. Fantastic question. Well, technology is making a lot of impact when it comes to the quality of mental health care. Um, you know, let's break it down. When we talk about the quality care, boils down to three key components in mental health. Number one is the accurate diagnosis. Number two is precise treatment plan, a tailored treatment plan. And number three is compliance to that treatment plan. So let's first talk about the diagnosis. Now diagnosis in psychiatry can be a lengthy process. We do not have blood tests or lab tests to diagnose, which means we really need to get to know our folks we need to sit down with them, understand where they are coming from, and we need to resolve the gray areas in their presentations. Since we are dealing with human behavior, their presentations can overlap in various psychiatric symptoms. Now, that is not always done just because of lack of time. Providers do not have enough time. Plus, 70% of the mental health care is given by family physicians, primary care, and they might not be trained to that level in the psychiatry diagnosis. So that is where 
technology can really help us. Data science and AI can help us identify patterns in patient's presentation, and it can help us simplify the process. It can help us shorten it. It, it can help us pick up the discrepancies that are there to help us also pick the misdiagnoses. And the most importantly, it can identify those high yielding questions when we are talking to patients to, to kind of reduce the amount of time spent. Plus, if the standardization will come, it will also help us teach our family physicians and the mid-levels. So that's how it can improve the quality. Now, moving on to the treatment. Now, currently, our treatment guidelines are very, very generalized. So for example, if I have to treat a child with anxiety, the guidelines are, I need to try therapy first. And if that doesn't help, then I need to try medication A for a certain amount of time. If that doesn't help, then medication B and so on. And these guidelines apply to all children and adolescents up till age 18, boys or girls. Technology can help make it more personalized. So with data science and AI, we can, they can help us kind of identify, they can analyze the data from that particular patient and similar patients and how is the outcome in those patients. And maybe tell us that is the medication C that is more likely to work in this particular patient. So we can try that and skip that trial and error of medication A and B. Great, Next, great. I'd say the compliance to the treatment. So we can have the best of the diagnoses and the, the most tailored treatment plan, but that needs to be followed. And compliance is a challenge in, in healthcare, let's face it, um, more so in psychiatry. And Technology is really shining in this area where it can really improve patient engagement and hence improve compliance. So, so you see technologies, it's just not a tool. It's also, it's really our ally when it comes to delivering a quality mental health care. Thank you, Dr. Bansu. It's really, very really informative. And then I love the idea that you broke down as three individual components of diagnosis, treatments, and compliance. And I believe you picked up the last question on the word to say that patient engagement. Can we go as a can we go elaborate a little bit more on how the digital technology or AI or just in general about how does patient engagement has improved with technology in the coming days and what do you see as future from here? Sure, sure, thanks for asking. Yeah, so technology can, it's already doing this, but it can even there's, you know, there's, there's more, um, I think, room to, to get better in this, in this area. Um, telepsychiatry now has been out there for a while and it right. has improved the way we deliver mental health care. It has improved the accessibility. It has made the visits with psychiatry and therapy more convenient, hassle-free. Uh, people do not have to block three hours in their schedule to see their providers. Um, it is even more important in psychiatry as compared to other fields because people have to see their therapist every week or two weeks. So they tend to miss appointments. And with in-person, you have to block more time. With virtual, they, if they miss less, because now it is convenient, that means they are going to be more compliant with the treatment plan as well. So that's how it improves that engagement and improves quality. Next, I would say the psychoeducation. Uh, the education piece, technology is, is really very helpful here. Uh, with Think about all the, the gamification that, that we have, all those interactive tools. It has made the education fun, engaging. And if people know about their psychiatry presentation, they know what to do, they know do's and don'ts, they consume that, they are more likely to follow it, which means a better treatment outcome. Um, number three, I would say the self-help tools. Now, most of the treatment plans include or should include a component of um, lifestyle changes or conscious choices. Um, and that's part of the psychiatry treatment. That's one of the components. It's not always easy to follow that we all know. Um, yes. But with technology, it can technology can help create those self-help tools that can be at the access 
of people and it can make easier for them to to you know implement those tools there are a lot of apps out there with those point solutions already uh, as right. i said technology is already held in this direction but you know, there's still uh, sky is still the limit fantastic great narrative great narrative dr ban so i'm picking up a lot of new keywords and all the new stuff but i'm going to pass it down for for the down the conversation, one of the keywords I picked up was accessibility, right? So Dr. Matthews, let's go to your side. How do you envision this accessibility has reached uh, the patients of underserved un regions that is not being able to provide? How does technology or IT or digital apps that Dr. Bunsell is talking about, how has it reached to the Patients who are in remote and underserved locations in terms of accessibility. Can we can you walk us through and what do you see? What do you see from your point of view there? Yeah, thank you for the question, Satya. Um, the accessibility, uh, as Dr. Bunsell pointed out, uh, there has been a significant transformation in accessibility to healthcare with uh, the advent of uh, telemedicine uh, and with the, with its uh, acceptance as a uh, valid. Um, interaction uh, and formation of a doctor-patient relationship by CMS and other payer organizations. So that in the last five years, we have uh, crossed a burden uh, or, or a wall that has been in existence for the last multiple decades. Uh, telemedicine is not a new uh, technology. It's been around for more than a few decades, but due to regulatory constraints, its utilization was very, very limited. And that I think has been the number one uh, positive change towards improving uh, equitable uh, healthcare, uh, especially mental healthcare, since uh, specifically with mental health, uh, it, it is perhaps the most prevalent uh, healthcare challenge in, the, in our society. And in fact, in a lot of societies, especially more advanced societies, uh, and uh, the personnel has uh, have to be trained uh, and they spend a lot of time, so they are not easily replicable. So with the advent of technology, it has been part possible uh, with telemedicine to reach out anywhere in the world and uh, carry out a high quality uh, clinical um, interview, high quality treatment plan, and so on. There are... There are areas that we can improve further. And the primary area that I see as uh, a, a, a opportunity for improvement is actually knowledge and, and education that these services are available, number one. Uh, because a lot of people, uh, especially patients, uh, are unaware of a lot of these services, especially the more you move out into uh, poor access areas. Right. And therein, uh, the primary care uh, providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, and so on, who are there on the ground uh, taking care of these patients, uh, play a huge role. The mm -hmm. other uh, key player in this is the payers, who also can play a big role in educating their customers about the access to these services. Now, once that education has been carried out, uh, we have the responsibility and also the opportunity to go in two divergent ways, uh, repetitive, uh, non-outcomes-based, um, business-as-usual kind of treatment modalities, or uh, treatment based on the needs of the specific patient. And I've been watching this space for about a decade now, and I think with the advent of uh, Gen AI uh, and the advancements of uh, within the NLP world, uh, we kind of stand at that crossroad where we really have the ability to tailor treatment specific to uh, patients. And this is even more so relevant in underserved areas because underserved areas have their own unique set of challenges. So the, uh, the recommendations or treatments uh, that might be relevant to a large city population uh, may be different from what the needs of an underserved area are. Their challenges are different. Their day-to-day -day lives are different. So even our mo treatment modalities need to be uh, flexible. So I think AI really provides us with that opportunity to tailor patient treatment and uh, 
uh, management specific to specific population groups. And there is very good data sets that can be built on in order to achieve that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. I think it was very profound and very deep and answers about how you broke this into three categorizations, right? You kind of looked into this market segment for about a decade, decade or two, and then you see where the value is going. And you also brought in the cultural change of how the metros will have to react to the underserved public communities and what how health plans and health providers are looking at it. Uh, from this whole context, I wanted to I wanted to break a little bit silently different here is like I've seen a change in the mental health and then telehealth as well. So I call this pre-COVID and post-COVID scenarios, right? The pre-COVID was very, as you said, it was there wasn't a growth, it was people on need basis and use basis and stories, right? Post-COVID, there has been a dramatic change in, or during COVID, there has been a dramatic change about the telehealth, how it moved on to it, and then how mental health has been improving and how it is have been accessible and accessible. You talked about that, right? So while it is a very mature and growing to get to a mature environment in mental health, I'm sure there are a few successes that has already been accomplished in the space can you can you talk to me about whether this is a growth for AI based models in future or right right next coming up there? What are some of the current successes or use cases that you have seen in the mental health space since or post COVID that has been changes? And I want to see what do you see as success stories so far in the mental health space. Well, there are uh, there are two aspects to that. Uh, one is well, I'd like to. Um, define it based on my understanding of success and what success truly might uh, look like and uh, also sure. um, you know what what uh, uh, any kind of organization engaging in the activity uh, would define as a success so in terms of accessibility like we mentioned before there has been a significant improvement uh, there are companies like elios health that are doing a really good job very innovative work and uh, there are a number of other non-mental health uh, care related companies that have been uh, doing some really good work, but I'm not entirely sure if their focus is just mental health. So eventually good medicine is good medicine. It doesn't matter if it's mental health, um, surgical work, uh, 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 you know, diabetes care or whatever it might be. And some of these companies like Athelos and Scully.ai they are doing some really good work in uh, improving uh, the quality of uh, work and the ease of work that physicians deliver. Eventually, as you know, a large part of the physician's workday is taken up by mostly administrative work. And in administrative work, I would include uh, documentation and so on, which has a big... So if I'm paying more attention to my charting, that means that I'm paying less attention to the patient in front of me. And as you know, a lot of people, uh, patients would tell you that um, now when I go to see my doctor, uh, they are mostly talking to the computer, right? And so if we can take away that time and enable the physician to actually uh, focus on the interaction, that by itself will lead to an improvement in uh, the overall patient experience and hopefully in the improvement in the outcomes. And reducing physician workload, uh, has been something that uh, has been a challenge for decades. And now with companies, like I mentioned before, that workload has been improved or reduced. So I, I think in my own personal experience, the quality of work improves. Now, there are companies that are still in the early stages that are starting to look at populations so that conditions or undiagnosed uh, uh, care, uh, problems can be diagnosed early, detected, and a treatment plan put in place for that. So I think that is that is the next area of growth about how do we manage not just individuals and how do we transition that to manage populations? How do we uh, not just accurately diagnose the person who is there, but also pick up the uh, sentinel signs of uh, critical mental illness or uh, uh, major mental illness, even when the person is not talking about it, and 
use those sentinel signs to trigger a more thorough and detailed evaluation. And once that is done, so I, I'm not aware of any companies that are on a, 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 a that have marketed a product for that. But once that is done, the other companies that I mentioned, they do an excellent job of making the uh, or or freeing the provider time, focusing on uh, on uh, the relevant uh, topics for the patient, improving the analysis and diagnostic quality, and also now helping with the diagnosis and making treatment recommendations. And I think that is where things are going to continue to move, and players who will be able to provide that solution are going to win. Fantastic. I mean, it was a very, very detailed conversation, Support. I think I picked up on a few words there, documentation, where the the clinicians are spending a lot of time in front of the documentations, doing it accessibility to the computers and apps and companies. What it kind of brings me the very next question that when we have this technology, uh, companies providing a lot of data and then documentations, I want, I want to take the next question where it's very prevalent ask you about how do you vision the security and how do you vision the data privacy that is coming along with this technology? Can you give me some your thoughts on how it's currently getting managed in terms of securities and as well as what 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 we consider as patient data privacy and security, which is, which is very key because there is a lot of technology movements involved in this. Let's talk about that a little. Yeah, so with... Uh... I'm not a IT a security expert, but I would uh, stick within the purvis of what HIPAA would require. Right, and the it's a it's a significant challenge, but I think with uh, the experience of the systems with uh, EHRs for the last two decades, uh, a lot of those problems have been uh, elevated to a significant extent. So to give you an example, uh, within a lot of these AI models, depending on what um, model you choose to use, but the most common one from what I can see is Azure, which is based on chat GPD. Um, mm -hmm. And they actually do, uh, it's and at the end, uh, Azure is in turn uh, owned by Microsoft. Uh, they actually do a very good job of providing a HIPAA secure environment for, for, uh, uh, for any data that flows through there. Now, who can access the that information uh, is is a different challenge. Now, as you know, uh, psychiatry or mental health is considered to be a subset of HIPAA. So even among, uh, especially psychotherapy nodes uh, and uh, data. So even among uh, physicians, we are not allowed to freely share details of uh, psychotherapy information without a separate uh, consent from the patient. So it remains to be seen how we are going to overcome that challenge because when you are engaging an NLP process, especially if you are doing it in psychotherapy, I think it, there would be a need to compartmentalize that further and add ad additional security and access layers to it. And I think, Great. but I think industry is going to do that, and I think they're going to do it uh, do it well uh, in the next few years. There are limited number of players who are purely restricted to the mental health uh, field when it comes to AI models. So it's going to be interesting to see what emerges in the next uh, two to three years. But there will be significant changes coming through. Thank you for that. I mean, I'm very appreciative of you giving us the perspective from your lenses of how you vision security, privacy from a patient engagement perspective compared to how we as a technologist see this differently. Uh, Dr. Bunsell, thank you, Dr. Matthew. Dr. Bunsell, from one of this conversation we talked about, also Dr. Matthew brought up how the apps are being there and what technologies are providing or how companies are doing it. And I also picked up a keyword from your earlier conversation about uh, self-help, patient education. How does how do you see this technology enabling independent users or people who may not be aware of this, that they would be able to do some patient education and self-help tools? And you brought it up a little bit topic on that. Let's go a little bit double click on that to see what do you see from your point of view? How are these apps, technology tools 
enable patients to look at patient education and self-help tools. Great. Again, great question. You're you're asking good questions today, Satya. <laughs> so, um, well, as I mentioned earlier, the technology has focused a lot on these apps and the point solutions so far. Um, now, I think it's time for us to focus on some digital platforms that can bring all these apps and self-help help tools together. So um, we are in, in the information age, which means a lot of information is out there, a lot of knowledge is out there to a point that at times, that's what my patients tell me that they get confused. They don't know where to start, what to believe, what to trust. Information can be contradictory and you know, uh, it might differ from what their doctor is telling them. Um, and you know, let's let's be let's be clear. Some of the information that is out there, some of those apps, they really do not go along with the traditional psychiatry practice. So what we need to do is we need to create structure where the traditional psychiatry knowledge and acumen comes together with technology, and we create a seamless process we focus more on the wellness journey of the patient. So we create platforms where we initially focus on the assessment, then the tailored treatment plan, and that journey is powered by the psychoeducation provided by technology, the self-help tools provided by technology, which are part of that bigger process, that part of that comprehensive treatment plan and that journey, and they are prescribed by the experts in complement with the traditional medical treatments. So with that, it will also bring the medical professionals and the technology together. And that's how I think uh, we can work together, the medical professionals with the technology world to provide that high quality of care. Awesome, great, great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Matthew, I'm going back to your things. Like I'm very profoundly intrigued the way you both of you are bringing the technology layered up together. Dr. Matthew, I wanna peek in a little bit. You kind of used and talked about a little bit about AI and then your use cases on using NLP, chat GPT. Uh, Dr. Matthew, can we go a little bit deeper? What do you envision that AI would change this landscape in terms of predictability, prevention, early diagnostics, how can all this happen uh, with AI? And what's your, what's your perspective on this? Sure, thank you, Satya. Um, well, I'll, I'll dovetail um, a part of your earlier question into this. Um, and because uh, mental health training is very different from a lot of uh, other specialty training, what AI enables us to do is to put a mental health specialist in every doctor's office and in every patient's pocket. Like Dr. Bunsel pointed out uh, earlier, there are a lot of point solutions, but I don't think that those are the answer here. If you were to track the patient journey, let's start where the patient starts and they, are, they experience some kind of a mental health challenge, their life is not going well, typically uh, and historically, they will reach out to their, uh, me, uh, their medical provider, typically the primary care doctor. And PCPs are the largest practitioners of mental health care in the, in the country, for sure. So how do we enable that PCP to make an accurate diagnosis? Because even they are limited by their experience and... Uh, by the their training and and also by advancements in 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 the uh, mental health field so how do we enable these pcps to operate like a highly trained um, or well trained uh, mental health professional and with the advent of ai this is the first time we have been able to do that so to move away from a a, a point uh, a kind of uh, apps that uh, that uh, deal with a particular uh, problem because most of the time the patient does not know that is what the problem. So one challenge I find is that patients don't know which app to download. So to move away from that and stay within the current uh, environment, which is 
you go to your primary care doctor and now the primary care doctor has the ability to do what a, a specialist would be able to do to a large extent, right? So AI integration into electronic health records makes the process much easier and it can significantly improve the quality. Dr. Bunsel earlier mentioned multiple times uh, the importance of diagnosis, and I fully agree with that. In my experience, uh, when people patients don't get better, it's not the patient's fault. It's because we have not made the accurate diagnosis or a comprehensive enough biopsychosocial model of diagnosis. We are more used to uh, putting in one DSM-5 diagnosis or a couple of them and throwing a few treatments without heed to who the person is uh, and often without even taking into account what some of their, uh, some treatments that have not worked, what is likely to work in that particular person. Now that degree of granularity takes a lot of experience. And with AI, we can program it in and the AI can talk to the patient, uh, thereby reducing a lot of the physician's work, come up with a more accurate diagnosis and a more comprehensive diagnosis and help address all the bullet points, all the important uh, signs or factors that may be involved in that person's uh, mental health journey. So I think AI is probably going to be the number one game changer in accuracy of diagnosis. And there are multiple studies that have shown that an AI system can almost with a 90% sensitivity and specificity diagnose accurately, uh, just as accurately as a mental health practitioner. So that is a huge burden taken off the uh, mental health systems and also from primary care physicians. They can make an accurate diagnosis. And once you made the accurate diagnosis, then you can tailor treatments. And again, AI will play a big role in making suggestions. I'm not at all saying that the AI should diagnose and treat independently, right. but AI can make a suggestion to the primary care doctor that, hey, this patient is not just depressed, this patient has got symptoms of suggestive of bipolar. Now, the treatment for that is quite significantly different from treating somebody with just depression. One of the things that is very frequently missed is the presence of uh, substance use disorders, right? Mm -hmm. And substance use disorders in terms of burden to uh, society, if you were to take between depression and substance use disorders, if you were to take any of the medical conditions that are the top uh, dollar or the top expense conditions in, in, uh, in the uh, society, both of these are likely to predict outcomes in a patient even with those medical conditions. For example, with uh, cardiac failure or poorly controlled diabetes. The question is, why is a person who is not treating the diabetes well or managing the diabetes well, why are they not doing it while another person with the same condition is doing a much better job of it? Typically, the answer lies in the, the state of their mental health, the sense of themselves and uh, what they see as being valuable. AI can, in the primary care doctor's office, provide the diagnosis, provide the psychoeducation like Dr. Bunsell said, and help move the person more towards uh, health and wellness rather than, uh, uh, than poor outcomes and uh, unnecessary and wasteful expenses, uh, not just in terms of dollars, but also in terms of the quality of life. So that is where I think uh, we are going to... Uh, come up uh, where we're going to see some significant changes. We can also use AI to track specific patients. For example, if there is a patient A, I can over time track their behavioral patterns, track their activity, track their uh, uh, medication compliance. All of these things can be done with the use of AI. But just before, because we track it does not mean that something is going to be done about it. So again, coming back to the primary care physician, you track that information and the AI can uh, flag uh, who are the uh, patients who are not doing well and then reintroduce um, the interaction with the physician. Again, use AI to find out why they are not doing well and again, find solutions to that specific uh, uh, patient. 
so uh, I, and and also the one of the things is uh, that you know mental health does not stop when the patient leaves the doctor's office right it's a daily challenge we all face uh, challenges every day and but physician access or a, especially a mental health provider access is difficult and it is time consuming and it's expensive so how do you use ai to take care of a lot of the uh, uh, the triggers or the uh, warnings or small challenges that a patient would uh, would go through and availability of applications that are in fact integrated into their initial database not as a point of uh, you know a point solution uh, like dr bansal mentioned a point solution is not going to give any solutions if it leaves if the patient's uh, condition leaves the scope of that application. Now, an integrated AI system, behavioral health AI system within the EHR can flag and trigger when the person is not doing well, inform the primary care, and then again, re uh, you know, uh, get into a more granular analysis of why that person is coming in. Perhaps that might take the form of, hey, these are the, these, this is what I'm seeing with you. You know, why don't we meet or why don't you look at this um, this video, or why don't you engage in this uh, 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 this fashion with another, with a perhaps an in person mental health provider to uh, to to find out how we can best help. So I think it'll it'll improve not just uh, the overall mental wellness of uh, populations. It'll in fact um, improve significantly. Uh, healthcare utilization and also the medical or the overall physical wellness of people. No, it's very, very grateful. I mean, it's such a deep thoughts on what, how we have thought through this. I'm, I'm like, in the middle of the conversation, I've always felt like you have been a technologist or a doctor. So you are like so granular to break this in pieces to say how in each segment of the patient's life cycle, starting with the doctor's assessment, going more deeper into the patient's journey, how you'd retract them, how do you continue to leave them with the office? And also I like the way you said it, AI in your patient's pocket. So kind of these are kind terms and very, very thinking further. I believe um, these are some of these things. But when we talk about AI from an industry point of view, uh, Dr. Bunsell, there is always some questions to you directly to you is there are some ethical considerations and some other that comes along as challenges when implementing AI. What's your take on some of this ethical uh, AI that would bring our challenges that you think overall? Great. Thank you, Satya. Well, as we have discussed today, AI brings a lot of uh, possibilities in mental health care. But, you know, at the same time, there can be some ethical challenges that come with that. So I think number one in my understanding is what Dr. Matthews has already mentioned, is that we should consider AI as our ally, as our assistant when it comes to diagnosing. We should not ever think of replacing that human judgment with AI. And the reason is that when I'm sitting with my patient, I'm trying to understand them, diagnose them, and come up with the best treatment plan for them. Um, of course, we discussed that algorithms can be helpful, the, the pattern can be helpful, but it cannot replace that human judgment that comes from that human connection. We call it mental status examination. And that impression, AI cannot replace, but it can definitely complement. So I think that is one thing we should always remember. Um, and people ask that a lot because I'm going to start my own company. Like, are you using AI to diagnose? And then, I have to explain them with this long answer. Uh, number two is, um, again, it's it's the same thing, but in a different form, is the psychiatry treatments and effectiveness, mental health, a lot depends on the human connection, that relationship, and that personal touch should not be lost in the process. So as we are implementing technology and AI more and more, that balance is required. So we need to be very mindful of that. Um, Fantastic. Go ahead. Next would be um, that these AI models are as good as the data they are trained on. 
So psychiatry, we call it biopsychosocial model. So if you see 33% of that is the social component, which means your culture, your background, your surroundings. Uh, plus for all medical fields, including psychiatry, the presentations depend on your, on your race, um, on, on your gender. So we have to be mindful if we have an AI model trained on population in North Dakota that will not apply to folks in Mumbai. So we have to be mindful of that. Uh, next, I think Dr. Matthews uh, has already mentioned, you guys have discussed, is the security. Um, so security, HIPAA compliance, and all that, you know, I will not go into the details, but um, pri privacy when it comes to the psychotherapy piece, all those, that's very, very confidential information. Um, and some, even EHRs do not allow it to upload. It's Some of that can be that confidential. So I think that challenge is there. Um, and the lastly, I would say is the liability. Um, so we are a litigious society, but even for rest of the world, um, I think that in case of adverse outcomes and AI is involved, we need to have this legal framework to understand the liability. Um, also accountability is important. So some, some rules and regulations, I think, are required related to that as well. Uh, so again, uh, you know, we, it, is, it is something that can be addressed, but what we need to remember is that balance is required between the traditional medical knowledge expertise, that human component, human touch, and the cutting edge technology. Great, great. Thank you, Dr. Bansal. That's very nice. I'm taking that one word from human touch, where there is advancements in technology, where there is a need for AI, that bottom line is the human touch that brings and connects the people together. Uh, with that thought, uh, Dr. Matthew, I want to see if you have any final thoughts um, overall that you think that we might have not discussed or questioned. Uh, what are some final thoughts on this whole overall mental health technology or just general? So yeah, my my thoughts are I agree with a lot of what Dr. Bunsell said. And AI and the rapid progress that it is making uh, should be viewed as a partner and an assistant. Uh, I think I, he used the correct word in uh, calling it an assistant. So it is an assistant that we can be as physicians because you know I, it, it is likely that we might see a significant amount of pushback because it is the unknown. So it is useful to view it as an assistant that will enable us to improve what we deliver to our patients and will enable us to do it in a much more accurate and more of a 360 degree way than we can because of our time constraints and uh, so on. So, I see many people being afraid of this uh, this change. And I think rather than be afraid, it is important for us to embrace it. That is one thing that uh, physicians should embrace this uh, change and see how they can actually use it for improving their own practice and for improving access to uh, patient care. The second thing is, I'm kind of to seeing two tracks emerging, which has in many ways been the bane of, uh, of healthcare in the United States for a long time. And technology is trying to do it in their own way. And physicians are and other providers are trying to do it in their own way without using, techno uh, using technology by going faster. I think we have to see a merger of those two, not by technology companies um, uh, uh, providing mental health care, but by technology companies partnering with uh, mental health care specialists in uh, the communities to actually provide tailored mental health care options that the, uh, that the current system of psychiatrists, uh, therapists, counselors, and so on can use to enhance their, part, uh, their, their practices. If not, we run the risk of uh, a pushback from the uh, from the behavioral health industry itself due to the fear, you know. And every uh, change comes with a lot of uh, uh, fear about what might happen. But rather than be fearful, I would encourage uh, mental health care practitioners to jump in 
and embrace it and use it to enhance your care. And there are already in uh, within the uh, payment models, there are ways in which this can be leveraged to increase not just improve outcomes, but also to increase uh, revenue. And I think uh, technology companies can actually do a better job to break down those barriers. They can do a better job of educating uh, physicians about what the opportunities are. Right, and so that we can uh, this 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 can be spread out into the communities much faster than them uh, operating in silos or uh, uh, posing a threat to the current system. Great, great, Dr. Bansal, do you want to follow up with your thoughts on that, please? Well, um, I would say that initially I said we do not have any blood tests. Uh, and lab tests. So uh, it just, you know, this point came to my mind. Technology is actually also helping in that field somewhat. So for example, with ADHD, we used to diagnose based on the symptoms and it can be difficult to diagnose because symptoms is I cannot pay attention and that can be subjective for kids. Parents can have their own thought process and teachers can have their own. And now we have a a test that can quantify those symptoms uh, and give a percentile score. And as Dr. Matthews was mentioning, um, with, with that clinical judgment that we have and with that score, it can, it can help us further. Um, and the reimbursement models also support the reimbursement of that test. So, so that is just one example how it can help us diagnose better, uh, more comprehensive assessment, and plus it also more, more reimbursements. So I would agree that we should embrace it and it is it is out there to help us, not, not to replace us. Uh, as we already discussed that human touch is always important. And medical professionals like us, I think need to collaborate with uh, technology experts like you and come up with this process where the patient is the center stage and we, again, focus on their journey from the beginning till the end. Very, very great. As we conclude towards the end, I kind of profoundly think that this has been a, such a great conversation, uh, Dr. Matthews and Dr. Bunsell. I'm taking a lot of uh, nice takeaways from here. It's like how silo can be a problem in future. I think Dr. Matthews and Dr. Bunsell, you guys are collidingly to say that, hey, partnership with technology is essential partnership with the right mental facilities to enable to the future is really needed. And digital is one place where we do, but AI being in, in the way you say it as AI being an assistance in this program, as well as fearlessness to adapt is something that I see from both of you guys. So adaptability to adoption to AI to technology seems to be you guys are forerunners in your own space in mental health. I'm very thankful for doing that too with us. And thanks for taking your time today to walk us through, talk us about the mental health, the evolution with technology, more advancements in AI. Appreciate your time today and appreciate you taking individually to walk us through it. And again, if there are any questions from anybody from there, uh, please do reach out to us at info, I-N-F-O at axionlabs.com. Uh, appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, both of you doctors. Thank you so much. Thank you, Satya. Thank you, Dr. Bansal. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Great. Matthew. Thank you. I enjoyed the discussion. <laughs> Same. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.